Hi, my name is Uri Hasson. I'm a professor at Princeton University. And today I'm going to tell you a talk about memories and storytelling. In science, we really like to control everything and to think that we can study each phenomena, like memory, decision-making, actions, by themselves. But in real life, as you will see, everything is connected. And once you start to study one phenomena, like memory, suddenly you realize that it's really related to what I'm doing now, what I'm going to do in a second, and how my memory is going to affect other people that in return are going to affect my accents in this future. So let's start. Before we start, I want to start with the most important slide. This is the people that really do, did the work. And I really want to mention Asia, Zenis, Chris, Yulia, Yara, and Amy, that contribute a lot to this work. So the story begins at birth. And we all know also where our story is going to end. And we are somewhere in between. Some of us more close to the beginning, and some of us more close to the end. And I start my talk with this sentence. The present contains nothing more than the past, and yet, through storytelling, it's going to shape our future. So let's unpack this sentence. What do we mean by present? And we can see that the word present is ambiguous. Is it like one millisecond? Is it the coming seconds? Is it these like sentences I'm saying? Or this entire talk? Or your entire day? So for now, let's define present. Let's leave it a bit ambiguous and say, this is this talk that you're going to listen for 35 minutes. And then you say, what is the meaning that the present contains nothing more than the past? It means that, basically, all the things that happened before, from birth to now, really affect who I am, how I'm thinking, and how I'm talking to you. And I'm going to give you an example in a second. And then we are saying, but why do we need to remember stuff? The past is gone. It will never happen again. Why do I need to remember? And we think that the only reason to remember is it's going to affect our future. It's going to affect the way we think and act in a second. So knowing the past helps us to predict what's going to happen next, and then it will help us move to the future. So in a way, you can think about the brain in this formula as a machinery that takes the input from the now, combine it with what happened before, and then integrate it to move forward into the future. So to give you an example, let's go back to my past. Okay? And let me tell you a story, a personal story from my childhood. I grew up in Jerusalem, in the border between East Jerusalem and West Jerusalem. This is me as a kid, and this is my young brother. This is my mid middle school, this is my high school. And basically, when we were really teenager now, and this is me as a teenager, and this is an example how you are not improving over time, and sometimes actually you're getting worse over time, or maybe this is a youth shape, and this was the lowest point in my existence, we find a donkey. And this donkey escaped from East Jerusalem to West Jerusalem. And as a kid, we were like delighted to have a donkey in our end, and we put it in the backyard of my friend, and it happened to be that his backyard was adjacent to the president's house. And we had this donkey for three weeks. We had like a wonderful time with the donkey. And then after three weeks, the security service came to us and said, the president cannot sleep at night because of your donkey. You have to let it go. And then sadly, we have to take the, the donkey and release it back to his children. So this is like a very simple story, right? So let's think what happened over there. I had this experience in the past when I was a kid. And now, in the present, in this studio, I'm revoking this story and tell it to you. Right? So in a way, I'm using words to reinstate my memories of the events. 
And you as a listeners now, listening to my story, and you need to imagine this donkey and my child in Jerusalem as if you were with me in Jerusalem. And if things is really working well, then you really start to be very similar to my responses when I was as a kid in Jerusalem. And now in this very simple example, you can see how memories connect our past, present, and future. So can we study the neural mechanism by which we do this like daily activity? And that's what we're doing in the lab. So in the first part of the talk, I'm going to tell you how we can communicate our thoughts and memories to other people. And in the second part of the talk, we will see how this connection can connect my memories with your imagination, or my past self with your future self. Let's start. We're going to start with a metaphor about communication. And the metaphor is going as following. Think of me as a speaker now, that I have some neural patterns in my brain that related to what I'm thinking. And I'm transmitting this like sound wave by speaking to your brains. So now your brains become coupled to my brains. It's really a wireless coupling, but what I'm saying now influence your brain responses. So, so there is a physical coupling between us. And my task as a speaker is to make your brains similar to mine. And if you manage to do it, then there is a communication and you understand me. Okay, so how can we study this process in the lab? What we are doing, we bring people into the MRI scanner that you see over here, and we scan the brain while they're listening to real life stories. And this story was told by a very talented storyteller, Jim O'Grady, and I'm going to play you a 20 second of the story in the middle of the story, so we'll get a sense of the stimuli we are using in, in the lab. So I'm banging out my story, and I know it's good. And then I start to make it better. <laughs> by adding an element of embellishment. Reporters call this making shit up. <laughs> and they recommend against crossing that line. But I had just seen the line crossed between a high-powered dean and assault with a pastry. And I kind of liked it. So as you can see, it's a real-life stimuli, and we're looking on people's brains while they're listening to these real-life stimuli, and the question is, how can we study scientifically what's going on in the brain in this very natural, uncontrolled setting? So this is what we do. We take one brain as a model to predict the responses in another brain doing the experiments. So for example, over here you can see, this is listener one, this is brain responses in this particular brain area, let's say this is the auditor cortex over time, and we use it to model the responses in listener two, and see whether the responses look similar to listeners one. So in this formula, what we are testing, we're testing whether your brain responses when listening to the story, similar to my brain responses when I'm listening to the story. So before the story starts, we start to scan people's brain when there is like no sound, when they simply lie in the silent scanner waiting for the experiment to start. And now you can see the responses in five listeners, and as you can see the responses are going up and down in all the listeners, but they are very different across people. However, immediately as the story starts... So I'm banging out my story and I know it's good and then I start to make it better. Now you see something else. Something you see that the responses is going up and down, but they are very similar across people. The responses become locked and going up and down in a very similar way across all listeners. And we call it neural entrainment, because you come, you come locked to the sound that I'm saying. In a way, for example, if I'm going out to clap, it's clap your auto cut is going to go up, and when it's silent, it's going to go out. This is exactly what you expect from a sensory system that becomes locked to the stimuli. But now we can ask, is it only happening in early auditory areas because the sound qualities, or maybe the similarities is locking is deeper and it's spreading across the brain? So now we can go area by area across the brain and see 
are similar to the responses of cost listeners. And this is what we see. This is not a map of activation. This is a map of how similar your brain responses to other people. The brighter the color, it means that you are more similar to people, and where it's gray, it means that there is no similarity across people. So let's start with the gray areas. For example, you can see that if you look on the, on the visual cortex over here, or on the motor cortex over here, you can see that there is no similarity across people. And this is because there is no visual stimulation and there is no motor movement. And if you will see a movie, for example, you will see a lot of flocking and similar activity across people in the visual cortex. But now let's look on the areas that show similarity. First, you can see it's not only in the auditory cortex. So the auditory cortex is, is over here, you can see it, and there is strong similarity across people. But there's also a lot of similarity across people in other parts of the brain. You have similarity in language areas, for example, Wernicke's areas and Broca's areas. You have similarity in the TPJ over here. And you have similarity in the precunius over here, or in the medial prefrontal over here. So that means that many brain areas become similar across all listeners and going up and down in a similar way when they listen to the story. So, so far we only talked about the listener, we saw that the listener responses become locked to the sound and similar across all of them. But what happened with the speaker? So what we did basically, we scanned the speaker telling the story in the scanner, and then we played to the group of listeners. So now we have the speaker responses while telling the stories, and the listener responses while listening. And now we can use the same model to see whether the speaker brain responses are similar to the listener's brain responses. But we need to complicate the model a bit, right? I am, as a speaker, I need to think what I'm going to say. Then I need to convert it to motor command to articulate. And then you start the process. So in a way, you are lagging after me. So what we are doing, we take the speaker responses and we shift it back in time. So now I'm measuring whether your responses now is similar to my responses a second ago. And we can also take the brain responses and move it forward in time. And now we're asking whether your responses now predict my responses as a speaker a second from now. And now when we have this model, we can combine the speaker and the listener and look in the brain. And what we see, we see that your brain responses as listeners become very similar to the brain responses of my brain as a speaker. So in a way, you can think about it, that what I'm trying to do now, I'm trying to make your brain responses similar to mine. I try to make your brain responses coupled to mine and very similar. And now we can test how good is this coupling and whether it's correlate to understanding. So what we did, we simply ask its listeners at the end of the ex experiment comprehension question about the story. And as you can see, some listeners got it really well and some got it less well, right? So now I know how much you understood the story and I can do the same for my talk and I can do experiments with you and give you an exam by the end of my talk. Don't worry, I'm not going to do it. And basically now, we have the extent of the coupling between the speaker and the listener, and the extent of understanding, and you can see there's a very tight connection. The more you get me, the more similar your brain to mine. Okay. And now that we have this phenomena, we can ask, okay, but which aspect of the story really caused this locking in its brain area? And you can think that there are many different aspects of the stimuli, right? This is like multi-dimensional real-life stimuli. Maybe you're only similar because of the sound. So maybe now in this particular moment of the talk, you are similar to me because the same sound is coming to your brain. For example, if I'm clapping now, your auditor cortex is going up. It doesn't really care what I was saying before or I will say after. It simply cares about the moment. But maybe the responses now in this brain area Actually, it depends on the word structures. And you know, it takes like 
50 to 200 milliseconds to say a word, and you need to combine phoneme for that. Or maybe the response is now, it depends on the word that came before in a sentence. Or maybe the response now depends on the sentences that came before during the talk. Or maybe the response is now, it really depends on what happened at the beginning of the talk, many, many minutes ago. So I think that the top, top responses over here is responses that are really living in the moment. And responses like this that really depend on what's happening across the entire story and responses that have a lot of memory. They're really carrying the past. So how do we test it empirically in the lab? We simply change the past and see how it's influenced the moment-to-moment -moment responses. For example, you can take the story and play it backward. So now I remove all the linguistic information, but I still have the same sounds going up and down, only in reverse order. Or I can define the words in the story and scramble them, and now I have a list of words. An animal, sorted facts, and write on pie man, potentially my story. Or I can define the border of sentences and scramble, and now we'll have a list of sentences. And they recommend against crossing that line. <laughs> it says, Dear Jim, good story, nice details. Didn't she only know about him through me? And I can do the same for the paragraph. So notice, this is the exact same sound bites across all experiments. You simply change the temporal order or the temporal coherency between the conditions, but it's the exact same sound. And as you can see, you get more and more when you place the sound bites in the right order. So now what's happening in the brain? When we look in, into the brain and we play the reverse pitch, only the sounds envelope going up and down, we see alignment across people only in the auditory areas. So the auditory cortex over here responds similarly across people when it's going up and down but we don't see any other similarities across people in other brain areas. When we have a list of words, suddenly we see alignment in early auditory areas. When we move to sentences, we see now alignment in other language areas, as Wernicke's areas or Burkhardt's areas. And when we go to the paragraph, suddenly we see alignment in many higher order areas that we didn't see before. So if you place all the results together into a map, you get a very gradual map. And if I will zoom in, you will see it even better. And in this uh, gradual map, you can see that there is increase in the alignment across people as you go up high order areas as the coherency of the story increase. So this is how it looks like. Early areas become aligned across people for all the conditions, whether it's reverse pitch, word scrambling, sentence scrambling, paragraph scrambling, or the full story. If you go up in the hierarchy, for example, to the area marked by yellow, you can see that there is no reliable responses anymore for the reverse pitch. You need words or above in order to get reliable responses. When you go up, further up in the hierarchy, now, even for words, you don't have reliable responses. You need sentences or more to get reliable responses. And when you go really to other areas marked in blue, it's only the paragraph level or the full story that induce reliable responses. And this means that this other areas, I need to say many sentences coherently together in order to make your brain similar to mine. So you can think about this like blue areas are the area that really integrate information over long time scales in, in order to understand what I'm saying now. So now we have the first conclusion. We started a talk saying the present contains nothing more than the past. But now we can scientifically say what is the present. And what we discover that there is a different present for its brain area. There are moments that are present the sensory areas, they're present, living really in the moment, and they care only about the sound bites coming in very high frequency. But as you go up in the hierarchy, you see that the time scales become longer and longer, and these areas live in a longer and longer present, till you go up in the hierarchy, and these areas, their present, contain the entire story I was telling 
from the beginning to end. So they really accumulate the past and maintain it and use it to process information. And this gives us a very different model for memory than the model that we are used to in psychology. In psychology, we like to say, working memory is encapsulated from the processing. But over here, you see that the processing of the incoming information and the integration with the past happening all the time. So there is no memory system in the sense that is saving memory and doesn't deal with the incoming information. Each brain area has a memory. Early areas, sensory areas over here, for example, the visual areas or the auditory areas have memory. But then as you move up in the arc, it's becoming longer and longer, the integration window, and the ability to integrate information over time. So, so far we talked how the present is affected, but what happening before. But what about the future? We were saying that there is no point of remembering if it's not going to change what you're going to do next. So let's talk about prediction. This is the way we can move forward to the future. And you can think of prediction over here about the futures is the information that now going down in the hierarchy. For example, an area that integrates sentences can tell the areas that process words, I predict this word to come next. And this prediction might help you to process the incoming word. So how we, we test prediction? We took the story and basically we had a sliding window. And we ask people on Mechanical Turk, basically, to predict the coming words in the story. And after they predict it, we show them the answer. And then we ask them then predict the next word. And once they predict it, we show them the answer and then predict the following word. So basically, moment by moment, we have now a prediction of all the words in the story. And we have around 935 words in the story. So now for each word in the story, I know whether people can predict it or not. And this is a result across 100 subjects in MTurk. And you can see that for some word, everyone predicts, all the 100 subjects predict, this is the upcoming word. And you can see for other words, there is almost like zero prediction. No one can guess what's going to come next. And we call it like close probability. And close probability is the amount of words people manage to predict relative to all guesses, right? And now you can see how people guess as a manner of the scumming of the story. You can see that if the story completely scumbled, basically people really at chance level. It's not zero because they will say, for example, they all the time, or I all the time, and I happening 4% of the time. So this is why chance level is not zero. But you can see that if you have a coherent story on the sentence level, you predict way better. And if you have predicted on the paragraph level, this is the green line, you even predict better. And if it's really the coherent story, the blue line, your prediction is really, really well. And on average, there are about like 30% of the words. And now we can go to the brain and see what's happening during these predictions. So now we use ECOG. This is a setup in which the epileptic patient and we need to localize the epileptic source in order for this lesion area to be removed and elevate the epileptic attack. So they're going into the surgery in the epileptic unit at NYU University, and they place the electrode under, under beneath the scalp, and they are sitting and lying in the bed for a week waiting for scissors to occur. And gradually they agreed to volunteer in our studies and help us to understand the brain. And what we did, we simply came and told them, can you listen to the story? Simply listen and enjoy, okay? And now we can track the brain responses as a function of the prediction that we got from the previous subject on MTurk. So now we can take the, the word and divide it into the low predictability, low clause, on the high predictability, high clause, and see what's happening in the brain. And this is one language electrode along the posterior superior temporal gyrus. 
and these are the responses. You can see that the responses to word, there is after the word onset, and this is the dotted line, there is increasing activity that you start to process the words. But if you divide the word into the high predictability and low predictability, you can see that the responses to the high predictability word happening even before I'm starting to articulate the words. It's like your brain is guessing the upcoming word for the predictable word and it's guessing it right. And if we try to decode the information and really guess what, what your brain believes, what is the next word, before I'm even saying the word, you can see that for the eye close, I can do it really well, even before the moment of articulation. So basically, what did we learn in this part? We learned that memory is everywhere. And this memory affects how we process the information over time. But there are some brain areas in which they're present is very narrow, so they contain a short window of time of what passed, and there are areas that integrate information longer and longer along the hierarchy, till we get to areas that really integrate a lot of the information over time. And these areas that integrate information across the entire story are really important for understanding. So if you got me now, your brain responses are similar to mine, right? And then, also, if you got me now, you can predict better because you start to, to learn me. For example, you start to learn my heavy accent, right? So you start to have a model of me as a speaker. And by doing that now, you can predict better what I'm going to say next. Okay, so this is the end of the first part of the talk. In the second part of the talk, we're going to see how we can take these memories and the communication together, combine them, and how can you use this memories of mine, transmit it to your brain, affect your brain, and in return you're going to affect my brain as a listener.